Hello, my friends. Hello and welcome to Thriving Together. I am your host, Alexandra Nicole, and I am super excited to welcome Wendy Watson. We were having an amazing conversation before we even came on, so I know this is going to be wonderful. Hello, Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to come on and, and welcoming my insights to your wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about who you are as a spiritual therapist and exactly what that means. How do you help your clientele overcome the things that are holding them back? So I help people cultivate their inner relationships and really open up those dialogues, right? In order to develop those strong relationships. So just like you and I are having a relationship right now, or having a conversation, that's how we should be communicating with our spirit, with our intuition, with our higher self, and whatever is above and beyond that for you. We right. should be conversating and negotiating and making agreements and all of those things. Because if you're not in alignment with yourself, how can anything else be in an alignment with you? Yes, that's so good. And you said that backstage and we were having a little bit of a conversation about how there are times where through the onboarding process, when someone comes with, to me and they want me to help them scale their business, that I noticed that there are some fundamental mindset things that they need to work out before they come to me, right? Because I'm strategic. Yes. I want to empower you and uplift you, but more I'm called to help people replicate and duplicate the strategies that I've enacted to scale my business. And I wrote everything down and I want to give that to you. But sometimes we find that people are not ready for that because they have some mental roadblocks they have to overcome, right? Some mindset mm -hmm. things, some, you know, some self doubt. They have some limiting beliefs in which they would come to you for that case, right? They would come to me for that. They would come from, to me with the emotional blockages as well, right? Yeah. So how do we set aside the habits, process the emotions because emotions are important, right? go through the logic so that we can be intentional. And mm. once we get them to the intentional stage, then they're all ready for you. Yes. So you yourself, you were a child of divorce. Yes. You gone through two divorces yourself. Yes. You have gone through a plethora of things that have informed your choices and your decisions about who you are today. So Absolutely. how do you think that path informed your choice to become a spiritual therapist? So being a child of divorce, right? So my parents divorced at eight when I was eight and it wrecked my world especially mm -hmm. as an empath and such an emotional being, mm -hmm. I felt like they just completely destroyed the family, right? Yeah. So that's, that's where that comes in. So then my communication was angry and selfish. Mm. And I really hurt a lot of people with that type of communication. And, but it led me into making the same decisions and falling into the same patterns as my family did. Right. And so after that, after I don't know how many jobs I lost being told I was too abrasive, mm. right. Or being a perfectionist and not being able to curtail that mm -hmm. and going into my own two divorces, losing a child, dealing mm. with drugs and suicidal tendencies and all of that stuff. It's like, what am I doing? Right. Why am I collecting? Why am I collecting these people? Mm. Why am I collecting this environment? And so it really got me to look at the choices I was making, the information that I was taking on and discerning from other people mm -hmm. and the information and the energy that I'm putting out to people. Right. And a lot of it just stemmed around to the habits that I picked up from my family. Yeah. That I yeah. took on for myself. And it's like, okay, well, this isn't working anymore. Yeah. I have to change. Things have to change because I can't live like this anymore. And I don't want to. 
So did you find that there was a pivotal moment when you realized that you needed to do some introspective work and that, you know, you decided that you were going to take the steps necessary in order to heal and yeah. move forward in the way that you needed to. So what did that look like for you? So the first pivotal step, right? Cause anytime you go into personal growth, you always have stages, right? And at each right. stage, you're going to have another pivotal moment. So the first pivotal moment was when my manager came to me when I was working for corporate America in accounts payable. And while I was great at my job, I could not develop healthy relationships with my coworkers. Mm, mm -hmm. Right. So he told me, he's just like, look, if 70% of the invoices go through without incident, 20% get escalated to management and 10% we write off, that is our goal. And it's like, wait, you're willing to write stuff off? And he's like, yeah. This was like a whole new concept to me. And I was like, wait, that means I don't have to be perfect anymore. Mm. <laughs> right, he gave me that 10% of grace. Mm. Oh, yes, yes. To where I didn't feel like I had to be perfect. And when I, once I felt like I didn't have to be perfect, the pressure came off, yes. the shoulders came down, mm. the muscles became softer. Right. And what does that do? It makes your communication and the energy that you present to people softer. Mm. And then it's more receptive and they're more digestible. Your communication is more digestible. Even though you're saying the same thing, the presentation is softer. Mm, yeah. Oh, that's so good. So right. is that what inspired your 70, 20, 10 rule that you then adapted for your own company, right? So it yeah. started when you were an employee and you were working in the corporate space mm -hmm. and then you took that methodology and you created your own. That is so amazing. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the 70, 20, 10 rule in terms of you and and TBR. Right. So I, I turned that around and I started looking at it through the lens of communication. And I realized that the people around me, not just at work, not just in life in general, but also the people in my life, in my personal life, I noticed that 70% of what they said was their own stuff, mm -hmm. their own beliefs their own baggage, their own fears, their own emotions, but it was their stuff. 20% might have been some sort of combination between them and it being directly personal to me, but only 10% was directly personal to me or the conversation we were having at hand. Mm -hmm. So why would I take anything personal that's not meant to be personal towards me? That is yeah. their stuff. And how yeah. much am I taking in? Why am I taking in that 70% that isn't applicable to that conversation or is it applicable to me? Right? So it's, it's right. kind of filtering out the information that you need to take in. That's actually right. important to you. Right. And what's not. Yeah. And then flip it around on myself and what am I putting out? Oh, that's so good. And that is, that's such a great rule to live by because it gives us kind of some measuring tape as to, to, to measure what we need to keep, what we need to, what needs to be profound or impactful to us mm -hmm. and what is just throwaway, right? right? Because we do, we, even as just as entrepreneurs, as people, a lot of times we do think whatever it is we are receiving is a, a reflection of something that we have done. So there is a part of us that feels like, well, what did I do to deserve this? When really, when you take it and you look at it, you flip it around and say, I'm receiving this because of whatever this person is feeling or their lived experiences, or their toxic traits, or the things that they haven't worked on, it more than likely most of the time is not a reflection of something we have done at all. It right. is about whatever that person's perception is about the situation and how they determine to articulate their thoughts. Do they do it with grace or do they do it with anger, 
right? Yeah. Do, and what do they mood are of, they? Right. right. What mood are they in right now? Maybe they just had an argument with their spouse, and now right. they're taking that energy and those emotions into the conversation with you. You don't right. know that. Right. Right. So, right. like, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. and it really gets you. It really gets you to actively listen. Mm. Mm -hmm. You're actively listening to the conversation and you're discerning it in the moment. Mm -hmm. And you're actively listening to what is actually coming out of your mouth. Mm. So did you learn this as an individual first before you started to implement this into your company or was mm -hmm. it your practice that you had to develop that skill because you saw that that was imperative to be able to show up for the people that you have your therapy sessions with. Yeah, no, I learned it first. I strongly mm -hmm. believe in learning anything and, and really kind of honing your craft first, but mm -hmm. it was very applicable to my job at the time. And I was in my second marriage and we were already having issues we were still dating. We weren't even married yet, but we were already having issues. And so it really helped me to figure out what I was doing and try and manage that relationship and cultivate that relationship as much as I could. And right. then I realized how impactful it was for me. So then it was, okay, well, how can I teach other people to, to do this? And then, so when it was presented to me to write a book, I just knew that this was the perfect thing that I needed to write the book about. Right. So tell us a little bit about your book, Verbal yes. Turbulence, that's available on Amazon, you guys. Yes. Verbal Turbulence. So Who I doesn't have verbal turbulence <laughs> rolling up, up in here, right? Like, we all have that. So... Yeah. I demonstrate 16 different ways of how to use the 70, 20, 10 rule in my book in regards to communication, how to find gratitude in every situation and in every conversation, right? Who hasn't been told spoiled or you're no fun or you don't have a sense of humor and you take it personally, right? Mm. So I walk through the processes of that in my book of how not to take that personally and to go through the thinking process of mm -hmm. taking the, your ownership and deciding whether or not you agree with that statement or you don't and what mm -hmm. action to take or not. Oh, that's so good. And that's true because we do whatever someone speaks onto us or about us or to us. It is our decision as to whether we receive that as truth. Yes, right. it is. It is absolutely our decision to whether or not we take that on for ourselves. Yes. And then it's, what are we gonna do about it? Mm, yes. Oh, that's right? good. And it, it, really, it really sounds like you are really helping your clients elevate in, in the emotional intelligence realm, right? To really yes. listen and do the work and look with inside yourself. And, and that's where all the good stuff is, right? Yes. We have to become successful internally. Yes. We have to overcome those blind spots and those things, those aspects about ourselves that we don't know, we aren't privy to until we come up against adversity in order to move through it. Right? Right. So how do you, so what I help people do is move through that adversity with internal peace. Mm. Oh, and that's internal so Internal ownership. Yes. Um, okay. Right. Keep Put, put a put a pin right in that. That's so good. Remember that. Move yeah. through it with internal peace. And we are going to be right back in 30 seconds. All right, my friends, we are back. So, Wendy, 
please pick up where you were talking about that you help your clients work through the things that they need to overcome in order for them to receive internal peace. So what does that look like? What does that process look like? Is it a bunch of crying? Is it a bunch of, you know, just, I need to be by myself for a little bit and work this out. How does that manifest with your clients? So I help them walk through and develop a plan for themselves, right? Like what works for you? Right. So everybody knows what meditation is, but that doesn't mean what you're going to find on the internet for meditation is what works for you as meditation. Mm. Right. So I know for some of my clients, gardening is their meditation. Mm. For one of my clients, long range gun shooting is their med meditation mm -hmm. because it forces them to slow their breathing, get in touch with their body and really close out all of the thinking and really focus on that target. Whatever that target is for you yes, is part of the process, right? So we get them into, I get them to do um, energy body scans and really get in touch with their body to get in touch with their different layers of their, bot of their bodies, their emotional body, their physical body, their spiritual body right? All of those things to where they know when they're out of sync and then set the routines and set things in place to help them get back in sync. So whether that's going out into nature, whether mm -hmm. that's going to garden, right? Doing, setting your morning routine and doing your prayers or whatever it is that, or your manifestations, or your mantra statements, whatever you call it, Mm -hmm. so that you can set the intentions for the day mm -hmm. when you set the intentions in the morning mm -hmm. the rest of the day goes so much better and you have it in the forefront of your mind what your intentions are so when you get thrown off a little bit you're like no these are my intentions today right right yeah right? you realign with your focus for the day so what is an energy scan what is that yeah. Um, so basically you are using energy, right? Everything is energy, whether it's right. a book or a table or food or whatever, everything's energy. So you're taking energy and you're scanning your body to see where the energy is moving smoothly and efficiently and where the energy is muddy and, or maybe it's a little slower or maybe it's just blocked entirely. Right. Mm -hmm. So a muscle that has a knot in it can't contract and release efficiently. Right. Mm -hmm. and once you go to lift weights and that's how people get injured when they go to work out. Well, if your energy is blocked, then your energy is not flowing. Right. And when right. your energy is not flowing, you can't be working at your optimal level. Mm, that's so good. So when, when you're advising people and they are, um, finding their meditative release through, you know, yoga and, and gardening and, and gun range, do you just advise them to try a series of various different things to see which one aligns with them? Like have them evaluate their interests and what they feel most calm doing and, you know, how they feel when they're doing that. And then that helps you help them identify what they need to do in order to slow their breathing and be a little more present. Cause that's what it's about, right? Mm -hmm. It's just being a little more present and, and quiet, quieting the busy and the noise that sometimes isn't even all external. Sometimes it's just noise Most, in our head, right? <laughs> Most of the time it's internal. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. this person said this. What did they mean by that? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and then you go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Or, you know, you I sent out 20 leads today and I'm not getting any responses back. And then you start going through that rabbit hole. Right. right. So right. most of the time, the verbal turbulence is in our own heads and it's not external. Oh, right. Yeah. So you have to really quiet that down. You really have to like work on working your way through that, talking your way through that and calming the mind because once it's calm, you can think more clearly. 
Mm -hmm. When you think more clearly, you make wiser decisions. Exactly. Yes. When you yeah. think more clearly, the creation and the inspiration comes in, right? Exactly. You have to create space for boredom in order for the, <laughs> in order for the inspiration to come through. Oh, that's so true. And I actually, I tell my daughters that because, you know, this generation, they feel like you're not living unless you're entertained in every moment. And I tell my daughters that boredom is where creativity lives. Yes. Because if you're constantly inter you're, you're inundated with entertainment and, you know, external, uh, just, what is it? I can't even Stimulant. think of her. Just. Stimulant. Stimulants, exactly. You read my mind, girl. <laughs> exactly. Then we don't have the space to to quiet ourselves, to be present, to create, to draw, to you know, sing or create a masterpiece. It's in that quiet that the good stuff lies. Right. We have mm -hmm. to have those moments and be present. You know, it was funny when um, before I really. Be became a business owner and really started to see some of the areas that I needed to work on within myself. The shower was a, a we're just gonna we're gonna just say it, verbal turbulence. The shower was my verbal verbal turbulence spot, <laughs> girl. I replay arguments. Yep. I think about an email that I should have said and what I should have said this that and third. <laughs> And I said, this is not serving me at all. And it's funny because you kind of get wrapped up in that conversation when you're not even cognitive in it. You're just kind of in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. But when you take a step back and you're evaluating yourself and you're thinking about the ways that you can be better and you start to pinpoint the areas you need to be better in, that you start, that you start to say, that is not healthy. Right. How much time am I devoting to this area? Is this actually creating a solution or is it distracting me from being impactful because I'm in this, you know, verbal turbulent cycle, as you would say, you know what I mean? Right. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. The yeah. quiet is also when you start hearing your intuition. Mm. Right. Yes. So going a little bit deeper than what you were just talking about, because that is all true. Right. So once you get past all of that and you're like, okay, this is the path that I want to take logically. Okay. Get past all of that. Then you can start hearing your intuition. Mm. Then you can start hearing your spirit. What does yeah. it sound like? What does it feel like? What are they mm. saying? Right. Mm. So a lot of the times I hear people say, you know, I heard this little voice tell me to take a different route to work but I didn't know what it was. So I took my normal route to work and lo and behold, there's a car accident that made me late for my meeting or made me late to pick up my kids or whatever it is. So right. let's get you to tune in on that little voice that you're hearing and trust it mm -hmm. so that you'll listen to it. Right. Right. Oh my goodness. That's so good. And it's, it's so true because we have to, we have to honor that voice because, you know, I'm a believer in God. Everybody knows that we close out the podcast with prayer, but I believe that God gives us that ability to hear those voices and to listen to them. But I think where there's some disconnect sometimes is if we don't trust ourselves or if we don't allow enough space for quiet, then we can't hear what it is that we're meant to receive. Exactly. If How can I'm, you... How can you hear God if you've got all this verbal turbulence going on in your head? <laughs> That's fantastic. So tell me, so verbal turbulence, does it equip its readers with certain tools or techniques that you can implement into your life it that does. help you reduce that noise and be more in tune with yourself? Is that kind of the... Yes. So it gives you all kinds of tools and tricks. And I'll give you one of them today just for free because we're on the show. Yay. Smiling. Uh-huh. So it is scientifically proven. It only takes four muscles to frown. It takes eight muscles to smile. So it it's twice as hard to smile than it is to frown. But it produces all of your happy hormones. 
Mm -hmm. It produces all the happy neurotransmitters and the endorphins and all the ushy gushy stuff that makes you feel good. Right. Even when you're in, let's say you're feeling lazy or you're in a bad mood or whatever, just taking a few minutes just to smile. Mm. And just to produce those endorphins will change your whole mood. Your kitty yeah. wants some great time, Daddy. <laughs> Hello, yeah. darling. That's this is so Clementine. Good. Hi, Clementine. <laughs> so you advise people to smile. That's also something that I do um, for my clients and for my friends and my network. It, but I advise them to smile for a different way. It's more about the external perception and welcoming people because networking is so imperative to our success. We need each other. We need other people. And if you are out and about and you're engaging with people or you're not engaging with people, people are making an assumption about your character based on your facial expressions. Absolutely. One thing thing I had to work on was, what is it called? Resting, what is it? What's the act? Resting B face. We all know what that means. I'm not Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But honey, I had one. And I was like, why do people think I'm so mean? It's because that face you're walking around with when you're not thinking about it looks horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> so now I have I have intentionally put in effort and thought to making sure my face looks pleasant. And guess what it does on the flip side for me? When I'm smiling, to to expand on what you said, Mm -hmm. I'm feeling better because I'm smiling, I'm evaluating the sun, I'm thinking about all the happy things because my face is releasing those hormones, right? For me to feel that way. And then it just kind of compounds. Like my face looks happy, I'm feeling happy, I'm taking in everything around me that makes me feel even happier, therefore, I'm attracting people. People are coming and talking to me because I like got this whole thing going on. And it's, it starts with a smile, something that yes. costs you nothing. That's right. So somebody asked me like, well, when do you do that? I'm like, do that in your car first. Yeah. And like, I'll, you know, get all that gushy gushy stuff going first and then get out of your car and go grocery shopping or go to the networking event or whatever it is that you're doing because then you've already got all the motion set in place. You've got that ripple effect going. It's so good. So tell people about your free video, Wendy. Tell them about how they can contact you and your video. You guys look into Wendy, she's amazing. Yeah, so check out my video. It talks about the things that I walk you through in regards to coming over, getting over trauma, cultivating healthier relationships, going through impactful transitions, all of that stuff. And the tool, some of the tools that I use in order to help you go through that. Oh, I love it. Wendy, you're absolutely amazing. You guys connect with Wendy Watson. She is a spiritual therapist. She is the owner and CEO of TBR Spiritual Health. Want to make sure I get that name right. (laughs) Connect with her. Um, Wendy, it has been a absolute pleasure having you here i learned some things i had a great time i'm super excited about sharing you with my network thank you so much so guys make sure you visit her free video at info.tbrspiritualemails.com and you guys don't go anywhere because we will be right back with our next guest the lion fearless lioness special thank you wendy thank you i appreciate you